In the logic of the church's prayer, today is still Christmas. It's as if the, what God accomplishes there for us, what he's doing in that first Christmas, is so wondrous and so beyond our human comprehension that for eight days the church returns to the Holy Family, to the nativity scene of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, to contemplate, to ponder, to, to look more deeply into that, not just to let it pass as if it were a thing of a day, but to try to unlock exactly what it is, this gift of grace that God is giving us in the birth of his son. Some of you may know Father Jeff has a pretty marvelous nativity set at his home. He's been working on this for about 16 years now, collecting a piece or two a year, carved from northern Italy. Now, uh, for those of us who are his friends, this is great because, you know, the animals alone have gotten me through so many birthday presents. <laughs> Except we've been at it so long now, I'm kind of worried that I don't remember what I've gotten him before, so we're having this strange Noah's Ark thing happening of two of each of these animals showing up. We, we look at a lot of nativity sets, and it, it, you know, without knowing some of the pieces there, it can just kind of seem random, you know, what all appears there. But actually, in the way that this has developed since the very first nativity scene in the 13th century, all of those animals have a meaning. All of these different traditions weave together to help us look more deeply into what God is doing. For example, there is no German nativity set that is complete without a stork. Because this, in, 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 in that culture, it is the stork that is a symbol of the Eucharistic love of God, the self-giving love of God. Because it's the stork who, mother who plucks out her own feathers to line the nest. And in the German legend, the storks pluck out their feathers to line the nativity crash. It is God who gives of himself. And to understand self-giving is a way to look more deeply into the nativity set. The, um, the Nordic countries in Scandinavia all have a goat, one goat. The goat was the companion of St. Nicholas. And it's there because the goat is from the book of Exodus. It is a representation of the forgiveness of sins. It is the great scapegoat that once a year the nation of Israel would bring in and pray over and literally heap all of their sins on top of it and then drive it out into the desert. That something about what is happening in the nativity set is about the forgiveness of our sins and the goat is the reminder of that. The Italians gave us ravens. Because, you know, and this is in every single, again, nativity set in Italy, you have these two ravens sitting on the eaves of the, of the creche itself, of the manger itself, because it's evoking the, the prophet Elijah and the Old Testament, because it is the ravens who would come and feed the prophet in the desert. And, of course, what the prophets proclaimed, the Messiah, the definitive intervention of God to save us from ourselves and from our sin and from death, is revealed now as coming to pass in the quiet of that first Christmas. The, na the ravens, if you will, leave the prophets and land at the nativity to show us that what they preached in the entirety of the Old Testament is being fulfilled right here, right now, in that place. You ever notice how many Christmas cards have robins on them, which is weird because that's like a spring bird, except it's not in England. And so English nativity sets always have robins because it goes to the English legend that Joseph was not paying too close attention and the fire got to be too hot and the robins descended to, to shield the Christ child from the heat of the flames and their breasts, therefore, turned red. All of these legends are there. All of them, in some way, you know, represent something about the Christmas story. And we keep adding pieces to it to kind of enrich our own reflection. That's the point of these things. Each of them sheds a little bit more light on the baby that is wrapped in swaddling clothes. Because at Christmas, God descends in his supreme power to save us. 
His eternal word, we have all these beautiful words and images from Scripture, leaps down from heaven, takes our flesh to himself, is born of the womb of the virgin, becomes lowly in order to exalt us on high. All of these beautiful and marvelous phrases, but the reality is, of course, that happens. And we didn't notice that God enters our world in such a profound way. He's not greeted by the cheers of welcome. He's greeted only by the animals as he's born in the poverty of Bethlehem. Pope Benedict XVI had this marvelous way of talking about this. He says, you know, we tend to think of Easter. Easter directs our gaze to God's power, which overcomes death and teaches us to hope for the world to come. Now, however, at Christmas, we celebrate the defenseless love of God. His humility and his goodness become visible. That is what sets us apart in this world and wants to instruct us on a new way of living and loving. The Christmas scene is the revelation of the defenseless love of God. And having said that, Pope Benedict will go on to talk about the first two denizens of the nativity scene, the ox and the ass, who have been there from the beginning. They were a part of the very first nativity scene that St. Francis of Assisi sets up in the village of Greccio outside of Assisi in the year 1223. That's where nativity scenes begin. And the donkey is there and the ox is there. And it's been part of the nativity story from the beginning. So much so that most people, I think, believe that you read the nativity story in the Bible and the ox and the ass are there. Whether or not they're musically inclined, we'll leave that to the little drummer boy. But you know, they're not there. The ox and the ass are not in Luke's gospel. They appear in scripture, and that's why St. Francis put them there, but they appear a lot earlier. In the book of the prophet Isaiah, this is the phrase, this is the scripture passage where they actually make their appearance. The ox knows its owner, and the ass its master's crib. But Israel does not know me. My people do not understand. It's not a great phrase when the Lord is talking about them. It's basically saying dumb animals understand where good things and graces come from. But my people don't understand that I am there to give them everything. St. Francis saw these animals, the ox and the ass, therefore, as representing us, as representing the church, that the Jews and the Gentiles are both invited to behold the greatest gift of God. God made man. But then there's that question that lingers. Would they understand? Would they recognize him? Would they see the great thing that God was doing for us and for our salvation? Because the child in the manger makes flesh and blood, to use the phrase of Pope Benedict, the defenseless love of God. It is a marvelous, marvelous definition of Christmas. The defenseless love of God. The Son of the Eternal Father enters our world unarmed. He desires not to conquer us, but to win us over. Not to force us, because that's not love, but to captivate our hearts. It has been described throughout the centuries in the spiritual tradition of the church as the recklessness of God, that he would enter our world, that he would become man, and that he would risk rejection by the very people he created in his own image and likeness. But that's what grace does. Oh, it's powerful. It is the greatest power because it can transform us from within. It can reform us. It can free us from sin. It can even grant us life without end. Grace makes us what God has intended for us from the beginning, to be his children and to live with him for eternity. But grace does not force itself on us. Grace does not 
make us do anything. In the language of the parables of Jesus, grace knocks, grace calls out, grace seeks us when we're lost, grace lightens our darkness, but you and I remain free. Free to accept it or not. Free to welcome the transforming grace in our lives and its work or not. To let it flow freely or to put obstacles in front of us. To embrace the freedom of the children of God. You hear that phrase so often in Easter. Or to embrace our own sins and our own habits and our own ways of doing things. That is what Christmas is about. That's that's the story, if you will, that is held deep within that image of the first nativity. A paradox that power, God's power, is revealed most clearly in weakness. It is expressed most eloquently in the vulnerability of a defenseless child that has to be kept warm by the animals because he had to be born in a barn, because no one recognized his coming. Simeon was the first. It's why he makes that appearance in today's Christmas gospel. And he proclaims even to Mary and Joseph, you know who this child is. And now I have seen the revelation of Israel. All of these legends, all of these figures that we have over the centuries placed in our nativity sets, they're all about representing us, our needs, our aspirations, placing ourselves there, placing ourselves in the midst of what God is doing and the poverty of that scene to see the great richness that God gives us. Now, we could see ourselves as too sophisticated, to enter into the simplicity of the scene. The rest of the world, of course, have already moved on from Christmas. All the Christmas trees are down, the nativity scenes are away, but they stay up in our churches and in our homes because, in the words of the prophet Isaiah, we can now choose to know or not know, to see what God is doing or to not see to understand the paradox of power made perfect in simplicity and weakness. But Francis, St. Francis, when he set up that very first nativity scene, would have us see ourselves in the place of the donkey and of the ox as the two animals who literally cradle the Christ child as he's nestled there and they on either side of the manger. That is where we belong. That is where God reveals himself to us. Let us enter into this scene and welcome anew in our own lives, in our own families made holy by Christmas grace, the defenseless love of God.